All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, well, I think we'll start with intros. We'll talk a little bit about data privacy briefly and this legislation uh, kind of among friends and then open it up to Q&A. So my name is Tatiana Rice. Uh, I serve as policy counsel and I'm an attorney with a nonprofit think tank called the Future Privacy Forum. Uh, we really work on tech policy and data privacy, uh, specifically acting as a collaborative force between academics, researchers, industry, to really put together some good policy and uh, ethics as it relates to technology. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Null. I am the director of the Privacy and Data Project at a nonprofit called the Center for Democracy and Technology, and we work on a wide variety of issues like freedom of expression and surveillance and privacy, obviously, um, and so I lead the privacy team, and we work uh, from anything from ADPPA to state-level privacy work to uh, artificial intelligence and discrimination against um, disabled people or against workers or stuff like that. And hi, I'm Haley Tsukayama. I'm senior legislative activist at, activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, sorry, apparently I can't even get my own title right, but I promise that I'm here to, I'm happy to be here and happy to speak. Um, I uh, coordinate our state level uh, legislation work at EFF, um, and so a lot of that is in California, but I also get to work, for example, with the great folks at EF Georgia um, and work on all of uh, State, state issues uh, on all of EFF's issues, so a lot of that is privacy, but uh, we also get to work on things like broadband access, right to repair, uh, election security, so really happy to be here. So we were just talking, we can't believe how many people are interested in data privacy legislation this early, um, so again, really cool. This is my first time at Dragon Con, so uh, really fun experience. I hope we can uh, really engage on this topic. So I'll talk a little bit about data privacy general, generally uh, in this legislation, and I definitely invite Eric and Haley to jump in where I'm missing gaps and whatever I'm saying. So. Um, first and foremost, the United States does not have a federal comprehensive privacy law. So we have things like the Fourth Amendment and we have statutes that cover uh, privacy as it relates to the government, but we do not have any kind of privacy law federally that relates to you and your data as it relates to companies um, and, and private entities generally. So over, I think over 130 other countries do, and so we're pretty behind the ball on that. And in the interim, what we've done is had a state by state and sectoral approach. Mm -hmm. So that means states have passed uh, privacy laws that are applicable to their jurisdictions, uh, most notably California and recently Virginia, Connecticut, Utah, is there any others I'm missing? Colorado. Colorado, thank you. Um, and then sectorally, so we think about you know HIPAA as it relates to health data, um, and there's also financial data components as well. Um, so earlier this summer, there was something introduced called the American Data Privacy and Protection Act in Congress, and it has made it the farthest of any federal comprehensive bill so far. As of right now, um, it has passed through the House, uh, passed through the House committee, <laughs> I should say, um, and it is bipartisan, which is really um, new, honestly, uh, and bicameral. So, uh, anything else worth noting? Cool. That that's makes me feel good that I know. Good setup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll just start asking a few questions to Eric and Haley, and like I said, we'll have a pretty informal dialogue here. Um, but first and foremost, you guys want to just explain a little bit, you know. Why was this introduced? What was Congress really concerned about here? I can take the first step. So <laughs> I think, yeah, Congress is probably concerned about a lot of things. I think we've seen a lot of media coverage recently and over the past, honestly, 20 years that has sort of piqued people's interest. And everyone always says they care about privacy, but until this year, you really haven't seen the rubber hit the road. We've had lots of bills introduced over the years that were obviously never going to pass, and um, so I think now we're starting to see, you know, a lot of stuff coming out about data brokers and sharing, um, you know, your data being shared with data brokers without you knowing, and, um, and just like all sorts of general sort of distaste for, particularly the practices of the larger companies, what's called GAFAM, Google, Apple, Microsoft, 
Amazon, Facebook, which I guess is now. Well, now they're all M's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah M's and G's. Um, and A's. Yeah. So, uh, I think there's, yeah, the general distaste of, of those companies' practices and the data, and data brokers and uh, just the sort of like lawless land. So, you know, Tatiana talked about the sectoral approach to privacy in the U.S. Most of those privacy laws, like the financial privacy laws, don't actually do much to actually protect you. They require notice of what, the, you know, what a bank does or, or what a financial institution does, but it doesn't actually provide you a ton of substantive protections. The HIPAA, HIPAA law, which applies only to hospitals and doctor's offices, so anything that's collected about you that's related to your health that is not collected by one of those entities are is basically limited to the only limits on those practices are what's in the privacy policy of those companies. And then that would be enforced by the Federal Trade Commission, but generally speaking, those companies get to set the standard for whatever their practices are, and most of the big ones are pretty good at, uh, if I can sit closer, most of those companies are, are pretty good at accurately describing what they do, so there's not a ton of unnecessary risk of enforcement, but obviously we've seen uh, the FTC go after Facebook for a long time and Google, and, uh, so they're not they're not perfect at it, but they are pretty good. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of things going on here. I also think there's just a general uh, sense of um, one last thing that's sort of insider baseball-y is that Senator Ted Cruz is about to take, assuming Republicans take the Senate this year, then Senator Ted Cruz is about to take over as chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, which is the primary uh, committee of jurisdiction on privacy, and I don't think he cares as much about privacy as he does about some other like issues that we don't necessarily need to get into here, but uh, he's been much more outspoken about like Section 230, which is the sort of intermediary liability shield for social media companies. Um, so I think there's uh, there's a timing issue here, and then there's also just like a lot of stuff going on in privacy that people are, I think, finally getting to the point where like, okay, now we're willing to negotiate on a bipartisan basis to get us something that will actually help people, and that's really what we're going for here. EDPPA is not a perfect bill by any means, and it never will be because it has to be bipartisan to pass, but it is way better than what we have right now, which is basically nothing. Eric, actually, can I ask a follow-up? Um, not everybody may know what a data broker is. You want to just explain what that is? Sure. So a data broker is a company that buys data about people from the companies that collect it. So these are often companies you've never heard of, like Axiom. or So I guess the, the, the most well-known ones are the ones in the financial industry that uh, set your credit scores, so Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. They are all data brokers because they don't actually collect any data direct. Well, they probably do, but uh, historically they didn't collect the data directly from you. They collected it from banks and other entities, and then they would decide what your credit score is based on that information. Uh, there are tons of companies that do this outside of the financial industry. A lot of companies do it for location data, for instance, and then they share that with law enforcement, uh, or they sell it to law enforcement. And um, so, yeah, and there's others, you know, Cochaba and, and whatnot. No one's ever heard of them, so going through a list of companies <laughs> probably wouldn't actually be all that helpful or illustrative. But uh, yeah, there are lots of them out there. They make a ton of money. They basically do nothing except sell out your privacy. Um, the only thing I would add about Congress um, is that so California passed a, a data privacy law through its weird ballot initiative process, and then it became a, a bill in, in the legislature. Um, and I do think that kind of kicked off this new wave of interest in state level privacy law. I will, um, not to get all like Elrond on it, but I was a reporter in DC the last time, a uh, like, young reporter in DC the last time uh, that there was a bill even similar to this, the McCain Carey bill. And that was in 2010, 2011, I think, when I was reporting on that. And that was going to be definitely the year that we passed privacy law. Um, and I think I've heard that refrain over and over and over again. Um, and I will say that, you know, you're right that there have been a lot of bills introduced. I feel like I haven't seen anything that people were super serious about until we saw states kind of say, oh, well, California has one, and maybe we want one. And there have been a couple models that have sprung up. And I think um, that has pushed for. Um, a desire to see more of a baseline law for the for the country. So that's another thing that I would add. 
Cool. Uh, and in, like another example, I guess I would say, um, kind of to Eric's point about the sectoral laws and HIPAA, um, a real good example that you have is like if any of y'all have uh, like a health app on your phone or a fitness tracker, none of that's covered by HIPAA. So all of that health data theoretically can and probably is sold to other companies and used for whatever means that they want to because they lack a relationship with you. Um, so I guess to that point about uh, U.S. generally not having a federal privacy law, there are other countries like, or entities like the European Union, who were one of the first or largest uh, data privacy laws with the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. Regulation. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, California um, and other countries all around the world. So. We might have differing opinions here, but you know, what do you all think in terms of giving a rank to ADPPA, rank A plus to F minus? Where do you think it is as it compares to these other laws, and why? Maybe it makes sense to talk about substantively what the bill does first, and then we can sort of Go assign it, it a grade. <laughs> um, so, in a nutshell, basically what the ADPPA does is. Um, it sets a, so it, it attempts to do what we've been talking about for so long, which is stop putting the privacy onus on you all and people in general and start putting it on the companies themselves and have them actually have to meet a standard that they would have to prove in court or whoever is enforcing the law. And so the, it's, the start of the bill is data minimization, which is any basically any data that you collect has to be, be reasonably necessary and proportionate to the service you're providing to the person who's requesting it. Uh, but the the more key aspect of this is with sensitive data. And so for a long time we've talked about sensitive versus non-sensitive data. And sensitive data is the type types of data that is like more personal, more private, so like health data, finance data, like any identifying numbers like a social security number or a driver's license number, uh, usually photos of your face like facial recognition, that's generally considered um, sensitive as well. And so with sensitive information, which in ADPPA is defined fairly broadly, uh, all of that data, companies can only collect it and process it if it's strictly necessary. So there's like two-tiered uh, protection. So if it's non-sensitive, it only has to be reasonably necessary and proportionate to the service. And then if it's um, sensitive, it has to be strictly necessary. And then you you can only transfer that data pursuant to uh, opt-in consent, which is, you know, the default is they can't share it unless they ask you and you say yes, and then they're allowed to share it. Uh, otherwise, if you don't say yes or you say no affirmatively, they're obviously not allowed to share it. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of the ADPPA is that companies are not allowed to use sensitive data for targeted ads. So just like straight up, if, you, if they have health data about you, if they have finance data about you, um, but they have the contents of your communications, which is another type of sensitive data, can't be used for targeted advertising. They can use it for other sort of like internal things, um, but and to provide the service that they're providing, obviously, but they can't use it for targeted ads. Uh, one of the other key aspects of ADPPA is that it has a really strong civil rights section that prevents discrimination um, pretty broadly. And uh, it is actually, it clarifies a lot of gaps in civil rights laws. Currently there's, you know, not every civil rights law covers every protected class that you would think. It doesn't cover it in every situation that you would want it to. And there's a lot of state laws that protect civil rights, but those also question a lot of, um, a lot of them is not, it's not clear that they apply to online services. They, are, they might only apply to uh, like brick and mortar stores or um, you know, like a, a physical diner. So this bill clarifies that all of that stuff is now covered. Um, online services, it's got a, a, a fairly good list of protected classes. And so for that reason, this is actually viewed as a pretty strong civil rights bill as well, not just privacy, but also civil rights. And for a long time, organizations like ours have been pushing privacy rights or civil rights, and you can't have one without the other. So, and that's a, you know, one, of, one of the reasons that the ADPPA is so strong. And I guess the grade I would give it, so all of this is in the context of it has to be a bipartisan bill. So as I said, it's not perfect, but it has to be bipartisan because we have to get 60 votes in the Senate, and we can't do that. 
Um, in a perfect world, if we had 60 people in the Senate, 60 senators who wanted very strong protections and could overcome a uh, filibuster, then that would be awesome, but sadly we don't. So I would say as far as a bipartisan bill goes, it's probably like an A minus or a B plus as, as far as just like, you know, is it everything I want? No, it's not. But um, I think we've made a lot of progress on both sides of the aisle coming to an agreement uh, that I think is pretty good. And as I said, again, better than what we have now, which is basically nothing. Um, I'm so loath to give grades. Um, but I will be on, you know, put it on the table that, so EFF is, we're neutral on this bill. We don't, we neither support nor oppose it. We have a, a couple more concerns in, in the details. So um, again, like Eric has caveated things very well. I understand how, how compromise has to work in Congress, but um, for us, it's probably more like a, like a C. a C bill. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, you want to elaborate on that? What do you, what do you see as the weaknesses? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have, a, we have a few things. I think one, um, one is definitely the um, the interaction between how the federal law will work and how state laws will work. Um, you know, I work in state legislatures, so obviously I have a particular view, but um, I have seen states, you know, I mean, it's hard to pass things when legislatures move slowly. I've seen my earlier comments about Congress. But, um, you know, we have seen state lawmakers responding to consumers, responding to concerns um, after the last election about how data was used, um, really try and and think hard about privacy and kind of use states as what they call the laboratories of democracy. Um, federal bill would prevent states from further action on a lot of areas of privacy, and that is one thing that we have concerns about. So um, it sets more of a ceiling uh, that you can't go beyond than a floor that you can build on. Um, in general, we would we like in, in federal law, you know, if it's a really strong federal law, um, then you know, we're okay with the ceiling, but I think in this case, we do think that states in the future could do better. So we'd like to see more leeway for them to build on that. Um, a lot of the privacy laws that we've mentioned, HIPAA, the, the health privacy law, FICRA, the financial privacy law, those are all floor, not ceiling um, uh, privacy laws, uh, federal privacy laws, and we have seen states build on that. Um, you know, so California, Texas, like a lot of them have stronger laws than the, than the federal floor. We'd really love to see that. In, in this particular bill, um, but it is a hard sell, and I do understand that. Um, but that is that is a major sticking point for us. I think just cutting off that that ability to do future work in the states, um, Congress moves even more slowly than state legislatures, and so uh, in terms of being able to respond to new things that we may not be thinking of right now, new privacy threats that we may not be thinking about right now, um, I'd really like to see that kind of clause changed. Um, there are a couple of other things. Uh, the way that this bill has an, um, it, this is really nerdy now, but <laughs> it moves um, uh, regulation of, tele of telecom companies from the FCC to the FTC. We have some concerns about that that I, I can elaborate on, yeah, but I'm curious. <laughs> Personally. Um, you know, we just uh, we would rather just, we would rather see both regulators on the beat when it comes to telecoms. Um, you know, there are definitely things that the FCC has expertise in. There are existing laws, the Communications Act of 1934, that they've been using to prosecute to go after telecommunications companies for privacy violations, including things like selling location data to data brokers. Um, and we just really hate to see all of that, um, that legacy of enforcement, all of that expertise of enforcement go away from the FCC and move to the FTC. We'd rather see both. Um, and then there are some other things like uh, in terms of empowering individuals. Um, one thing that is great about this bill is it does have a private right of action, which means that you can sue, individuals can sue over uh, a lot of violations in the bill. Um, but we would like to see that expanded. It's another really contentious um, point between the parties uh, having a, a PRA, and it's actually quite difficult to pass PRAs, um, strong PRAs, but we would still like to see it um, in, in a federal bill. So if this is really our last best chance for a while, we'd just like to make it a little stronger um, and just make sure that the protections that we set down don't sort of get um, hollowed out by some of the, some of the details. Great answers. Um, I want to move back to the civil rights component for a brief moment because I think I would love to hear more because I see confu confused faces in the audiences. Like, why is a civil rights provision in a data privacy bill? What What is the overlap? How do these things intersect? 
and um, what does it specifically talk about? Like, what part of the provision makes um, discrimination against protected classes, marginalized communities mitigated under this bill? So we've known for a while that on com online companies have discriminated either intentionally or not against um, marginalized communities, uh, often protected classes that you see in, in civil rights bills. Um, and we've seen the government sort of piecemeal go after those practices. So there was a recent settlement with uh, Housing and Urban Development and Meta, formerly Facebook, about discriminating in their ad services. Um, there's other examples of Amazon used to have an algorithm that would uh, down downgrade women in terms of what jobs they would see and job opportunities they would see, and um, there's yeah there's just like there's so much research that shows that companies are engaging in these practices and the ability of the government to go after them is pretty limited. I mean they're they're doing the best they can but they're working with limited laws that apply in limited circumstances to, uh, to a small set of protected classes. And so having this sort of broadening of that, clarifying that, they go, that these protections apply online, they apply to disparate impacts, like all these things are very important for, to allow the government to actually go after these practices. Uh, but I think one of the bigger parts of this is that Setting this in law means that most companies are going to change their practices with the with the idea in mind that they wouldn't actually be prosecuted under under the law. Like obviously, companies don't want to be don't want to incur the wrath of the federal government, so they'll change their practices to make things better on their own. And so, even though I, you know the the private right of action is good, although fairly limited, like it, that's sort of irrelevant when it comes to civil rights because we've had. Um, we, we just need to set the standard at the federal level to ensure, okay, you're just not allowed to do this anymore, and you will, you know, there's there's federal government enforcement, there's also the prior right of action, so there's lots of opportunities to be taken to court for these practices, and uh, so that really, like, gets a lot of companies to sort of shape up, and instead of doing something bad and waiting to get sued, they'll just be like, okay, we're going to fix this now. Um, another element of this bill is that it requires companies to engage in uh, review, uh, so if they develop an algorithm, they have to review the algorithm in terms of bias against uh, certain protected classes, they also have to review it in, in a bunch of other ways, they also have to, uh, at least large companies have to do yearly privacy impact assessments, so there's a lot of um, built-in sort of procedural protections, and then there's also the substantive protection backfall in the civil rights section that I think will just, will change the landscape entirely for um, marginalized communities online. And I, I totally agree that privacy rights are civil rights, 100%. I think, um, you know, Eric, you, it, like, to, I guess kind of like uh, get into it a little more, right? It's just sort of, you think about all the avenues of dis discrimination that companies have and data fuels all of that, right? If we're heading, especially, I mean, it's happening now and we're heading into an era where algorithms are only going to play a larger part in sort of how companies make decisions um, about mortgages, housing, like really, you know, employment, really basic things. So, um, and often, you know, algorithms carry the biases, um, conscious or not, of the people who create them. And so um, if we don't really kind of interrogate how data and, you know, how data feeds and informs both those algorithms and, and the people that make that information, then we're, we're not really doing a service to, to the world. <laughs> Um, along those same lines, um, something that's definitely been, I think, weighing on a lot of folks is we are now living in a post-Dobbs world, mm -hmm. meaning um, under the Dobbs decision from the U.S. Supreme Court, there is no longer a right to an abortion. And that has led to a lot of concern around the ability of law enforcement to get data without warrants and from all these private companies that are not regulated by privacy laws in the same way that the government is. Um, so does this bill address those concerns at all, or do you see this bill mitigating some of those harms? No, you gotta go for I it. I keep starting. I no, no, start. please start. Please start. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 
this bill does some good things as it relates to Dobbs. It limits the amount of sensitive data that can be collected by companies and thus limits the amount of data they would have available to share with law enforcement or to share to share with uh, data brokers who would then share it with law enforcement. So in, yeah, in the first instance, it reduces the amount of data that would be relevant to a Dobbs investigation, uh, <clears throat> limits it in the first instance. The, the issue is that, so this is not a law enforcement bill. There are other bills kind of working their way through Congress right now that would also help with this. There's the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act, which prevents data brokers, or I guess, is it anyone? It might just be data brokers, but it's it prevents a, a large swath of companies from se from selling data to law enforcement, which was has been a way that law enforcement has been getting around Fourth Amendment protections to accessing data about people for a while now, for many years, if not probably decades. And so there's other efforts to limit that. There, California, I believe, just passed a law that prevents law enforcement from, I'm probably going to get this wrong because I'm not a surveillance expert, but uh, prevents law enforcement from in, uh, cooperating with an out-of-state investigation uh, that violates related to, the California law. That, that violates, yeah, that violates an abortion law in a different state. Um, so there are other things that are happening. The ADPPA limits some of the initial data collection, which is good, but it's still, like, there's only so much we can do in a, pri in a consumer commercial privacy bill uh, on, on this kind of issue, but I fully support trying to limit sharing with law enforcement and, like, the approaches that, that California has taken and hope that we can move that issue forward as well. See, I'll let you go first so that I have less to say. Later. <laughs> it was a very good summary. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was absolutely right. Like, it, there are tools that you use for different, you know, different problems, and I think that, you know, this isn't necessarily the best place to address law enforcement sharing. I do think, you know, there are, as Eric said, there are, you know, public-private partnerships, so where private companies are selling or sharing information with um, with law enforcement, and so to minimize data up front on those things is, is, is a really good thing. Um, you know, Dobbs is obviously one one example, you know, we also in California, we're looking at things like gender affirming care, um, you know, in terms of like records that could be collected from private companies and turned over to law enforcement, you know, on the other side of the aisle, you could also see someone, you know, passing a really strong gun law in another state and wanting to, you know, use that information. So it's not just about like one particular issue, right? It's like a whole set of issues in terms of uh, where state laws differ and, and how you show that information. Is there, I guess, anything else that I did not ask that you guys think is worth noting to people about the bill specifically? I mean, there's like 20 provisions we could talk about if we really wanted to, <laughs> but I will spare you all that. And if someone has specific questions, happy to talk about it. But I think it's probably good to open up to Q&A. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Anybody have questions? Uh, come up to the Yeah, there's a microphone in the middle here, um, and I, bel I, s I believe it's on. So I I work at a very large organization. I'm sure everyone yeah. would know it if I said it, but we have a lot of information around the world. We have customers around the world, and I support obviously like privacy because um, you know I think it's important. I think we need to deal with civil rights issues in it, but at the same time. The large organizations that have to try to implement these laws, especially ones coming from around the world, or even if you're a U.S. Uh, company, 50 different laws from 50 different states and our federal law, one of the only things that we've been able to do essentially is to take the most strict law that's available and apply it across the board. Um, what do you think are good ways to deal with that issue and make sure that we're being, I guess, effective and protective, but also, you know, being able to continue to do what we do as well. So, um, how do you bring all those laws together in a, a simple way? I'll start. Um, so, 
I previously worked at a law firm where worked with clients where this was exactly their issue constantly. Um, and your company's approach or organization's approach is very consistent with a lot of other companies. Usually they just try to follow GDPR and they assume that that's sufficient. Um, it's actually a reason why not everybody, but a lot of folks in industry and tech are in support of this bill uh, because it would preempt the state laws. So you would only have to really comply with the federal law and that would be it. And besides maybe um, some sectoral laws that maybe go further. So like biometrics laws um, or like specifically the Illinois biometric law would not be preempted. Um, we can talk about that <laughs> in a different time. Um, but you know, it, to some specific sectors it would go farther. But yeah, that's, that's the reason a lot of industry supports this bill. Add. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a, a consultant for for companies. I, I it's not lost on me that yeah, compliance is is difficult, and it takes a it takes a lot of internal organization and understanding of where your data is coming from and where it's going. And I think a lot of companies at this point have gotten away with not necessarily knowing all that information. And I think this, the, the revelations about Twitter recently, I think, probably show that, at least with regard to that company. For those who weren't following, there's a whole, uh, like, document leak, kind of, about Twitter, about how they, like, don't really have very good internal processes and don't really know what data is, where their data is coming from and where, what it's doing. Uh, and it was, um, so, it, like, I don't, Twitter's not alone. There are a lot of companies who don't know what's happening with their data, and I think a, a law like this sort of requires companies to actually do, like, figure that out and understand it and then be able to try to comply with the law. But, I mean, you're right. Like, having, if you're a multinational corporation, you're going to have to comply with GDPR. You're going to have to apply with, uh, comply with the Brazil law. If you're, if you're operating there, you're going to have to comply with CCPA if you're operating there. Like, it's, it's just a hard question that requires a lot of knowledge and understanding that up until now was not really required so and still not required because ADPPA hasn't passed but uh, if it were to pass then it would be required to, to operate but yeah hard, hard questions that if it were to pass companies would have to deal with relatively quickly and I admit, you know, as a consumer advocate, it's, it's a blind spot for me, right? I don't really think about, I'm trying to think about, okay, for the people that I'm advocating for, how do I get the most rights for them? How do I, how do I protect them the best? But I, I do understand, and, you know, we do try to talk to companies um, and kind of understand what they're doing, how they're keeping track of things, um, you know, so that we can make things maximally protective. Um, those aren't always easy conversations. They aren't always polite conversations, but I do enjoy having them. <laughs> One more thing I'll quickly add um, that I'll say I do like about this bill is it kind of differentiates the different kinds of companies. So like the obligations of Facebook are not going to be the same mm -hmm. obligations of a mom and pop shop, yeah. um, which I think is very, very important specifically for, um, honestly, like the economic uh, progression of a lot of marginalized communities. Hey, uh, I appreciate the letter grading of ADPPA. Uh, in in comparison, though, how would you all grade something like GDPR, and if there are differences between your grades for ADPPA and GDPR, like maybe one or two points of like why one is better or worse than the other, just for someone who has more framework for GDPR knowledge rather than GDPA. This is where, in my brain, it's like I have to like call them both up. Yeah. Them. <laughs> There's a comparison document somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think, I mean, GDPR is more, to me, right, it's more of a, an opt-in than an opt-out, so I think that's a, that's a big difference for me, as a, sorry, just off the top of my head, and I'm sorry, but, um, you know, for me, I would like to see a, no collection as the default, and then you have to, that people would have to ask me before they, they take my information, so I think that's one strength of GDPR that, that I would point to. Also a very difficult thing to pass through legislation, very difficult uh, to get bipartisan consensus on, but that is, that is one thing I would point to. Yeah, so uh, I'm not a GDPR expert, though I have worked in the periphery of it for a while. My understanding is that GDPR is mostly principles-based and opt-in consent-based, and because of those two things, we've basically seen 
Not a ton of change in practices except for the cookie banners that we see everywhere. Which, you know, I love when I can just click reject all and it rejects all the non-necessary cookies, and that's great, and I love that, and I will happily do that till the end of time. But it doesn't do a whole lot to cons actually constrain the companies, and so I prefer the stronger data minimization approach of ADPPA that just holds the companies to a standard. We figure out what that standard is over time rather than just saying, let's just let people opt in or opt out of, of you know, every single practice. And there's an, this is another thing about GDPR is that you can just put everything in a privacy policy and that's assumed you accept it. In ADPPA, there's a little bit more specificity around what you have to say when you're getting consent. Uh, so consent has to be specific, so it has to be about a particular practice and not just, here's everything we do in a 30-page privacy policy. By continuing to use our service, you consent to all of it. Like that, that hasn't really shown to be all that effective. Sure, if everyone had tons of time to read all the privacy policies <laughs> that they interact with and actually make informed decisions that would maybe would be okay, but obviously it has been proven over the last 20 years that that is just not a reasonable expectation. I think um, because GDPR was passed before a lot of laws in the U.S., we've borrowed a lot from GDPR, honestly, um, and ADPPA, there are areas where it's stronger and areas where it's weaker than GDPR. The main thing that I think is interesting between them is in the EU there is a constitutional right to privacy, mm -hmm. uh, which we don't have. And so a lot of things are weighed they against... have it in California, right? Uh, uh, well, okay. <laughs> California, <laughs> Washington. Yeah, there, are a couple, there are a couple of states, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. As it relates to ADPPA um, and GDPR, um, a lot of practices that companies do are always like weighed against this constitutional right. Is this infringing a, upon an individual's constitutional right? That is not something that we have here. Um, and particularly, there's been a lot of concern around some of this borrowing from GDPR in terms of um, what data practices are prohibited um, because, and this is an entirely different conversation, but like our... Um, some, of ca some cases in the U.S. have found that data is almost a First Amendment right, and so limiting that data collection, some have argued, is an implication of First Amendment. So there is some um, areas where I think ADPPA tries to be a little bit weaker, um, knowing that there's some of those concerns, and I think they're still trying to figure that out. You're right, it's an entirely different framework, so it's like very difficult to, yeah. to do yeah. it apples to apples. So a couple of times you guys have alluded to the enforcement of these bills, and I'm wondering, is this a fangless bill, or what kind of provisions does this have for both enforcement and observation of you know, the tech landscape watching people collect all this data? Okay. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't call it fangless or toothless, which I definitely have called bills before. So. Um, yeah, uh, or empty. Um, I, you know, I, I do think strong enforcement is a really important part of having a strong privacy law because, um, and I'm not uh, speaking specifically to ADPPA, but you know, if, if you have, even if you have really great language and then no way to enforce it, then you essentially have no law. ADPPA is is stronger than than that. Um, I, you know, I do think um, private rights of action are really important to us because I do think often. In some cases, we see companies say, well, you know, we're not in compliance, but no one's going to come after us. Like, they don't have the time. They don't have the bandwidth. Like, no one's going to do that. So Our that is why <laughs> <laughs> that is why we like to see individual, um, strong individual rights to sue, um, because I think that is a, that's a big stick. It's a big stick to swing in front of companies, and um, I think it does encourage compliance. Um, you know, this gives the FTC a lot of authority in this bill. Um, FTC traditionally has not been like a really aggressive regulator on privacy, but there is a new, um, you know, they, there's a new slate of, of folks So um, <laughs> at the FTC. So um, it will be interesting to see sort of what they do with, with all that responsibility should it pass. So it's, it's, it's all right. <laughs> We'd yeah. still like to see it stronger, but you know, it's all right. The highlights on enforcement for me are uh, it creates a new bureau at the FTC or at the FTC specifically for privacy. It has to be of similar size as the other bureaus, so it's like roughly 80 million, 90 million somewhere in there at the total FTC. 
budget I think is like 350 right now and so and they currently have three bureaus so it's probably roughly around that um, another highlight is state AGs have a lot of ability to go after so not just it's not just leaving it all to the FTC uh, which will have a, a significantly increased budget on privacy but also any state AG that has citizens who are uh, aggrieved under the bill they are able to bring lawsuits and they have a pretty broad ability to get um, damages and that sort of stuff private right of action is narrower just because it's such a political hot button but the fact that it's in there is really good it's limited to compensatory damages so and injunctive relief so if you have if you were harmed and you had to spend money to uh, or I guess time to uh, right those wrongs and you're able to get that money back from the companies or more importantly at least for like the civil rights side is the injunctive relief of like oh you're actually discriminating against me or like a, a not me but uh, someone in a, in a marginalized community then you can say okay we're going to sue you to, just, to get you to stop this practice and then that has broader societal benefits the last point I'll add about the private right of action is how important it is especially in the context of a class action meaning that it's a large group of people suing a company collectively uh, because that is going to get you a lot farther in terms of making sure that the company feels, um, I guess, like the externality or feels like the financial cost. So if you have to pay every single individual in X state um, $100, that adds up um, when you are talking about every single individual in Illinois or every single individual in Nebraska that has used this service. Um, so having a private right of action, and in this bill specifically allows for class actions, is a big deal in my opinion. How was it observed though? You had mentioned that there was some kind of annual privacy report that gets sent to somebody? Yeah, a, a privacy impact assessment is what they're called. Mm -hmm. Basically it's the company or a third party reviewing their practices for, you know, how is, how is the X practice going to harm whoever, um, you know, what's the purpose of this practice, et cetera. So it, it would force companies to like engage with their data practices and make sure that they're not doing something that will actively harm people. Okay, so you. it's an upfront requirement as well. Hi. Uh, so you all kind of touched about um, the idea that this has been discussed for really a decade now and it really hasn't gone anywhere. Um, there's currently a case going on in Colorado that's a criminal case. Uh, the EFF actually filed an amicus brief on it uh, regarding keyword search warrants um, and dragnet war warrants like that. I just wonder, do you guys think that um, case law established through cases like that might actually get more movement on um, privacy laws for individuals than going through Congress and the politicking and all that, that can delay things, things like Ted Cruz and what you talked about there? Uh, do you think case law might be a better way to establish some of these rules? And do you, I don't know if you know anything about the case in Colorado, but I'd be curious if you have any thoughts on it. I'm, I'm, I'm the only non-lawyer on this panel, so <laughs> um, I know that we have filed that brief, but I, I yeah. I, I'll, I'll start. Uh, my <laughs> first reaction is no. Um, I think because there, it's really hard to stretch it to data privacy kind of in the context of like, let's say civil rights again, these bills were drafted at a time when the internet wasn't around. So judges, um, particularly right now being fairly conservative, are not stretching the laws that far. Um, yeah, that's basically where I'm at right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's just not a hook, unfortunately. I mean, with, with law enforcement, you can have, you have the Fourth Amendment, you have some, like state bills that are that are protective of it. But in terms of consumer privacy, there's so little out there to like actually sue over <laughs> that uh, there's just not a lot of opportunity to get those protections through through case law. And if ADPA were to fought, were to pass, then there would be a ton of case law afterward of you know FTC enforcement, state AGs, etc. That would further refine what the bill required. And so there's there's still definitely going to be a role for for law for lawsuits and for developing sort of like a common law a law through law through the courts system. But uh, yeah, right now there's just not a lot to go on, unfortunately. Yeah. Thanks. Hello. Um, so, I, my question kind of goes to the, uh, you mentioned applications that uh, collect health data that are not necessarily protected by HIPAA and that kind of thing. And obviously, you know, tracking your weight or tracking other health data, you know, those are not, but the, 
there are applications that um, are a lot of GPs have moved to oh you have to communicate with me via this application or this uh, service um, Spruce Health is one that comes to mind there's a lot of them um, and those all say usually if you go to their website they're all you know uh, one of the biggest HIPAA compliant communication platforms that kind of thing but then if you read the privacy policy they always have that one section that says something like um, you know, for any and all service, we'll use your data for any and all services that you have given us permission for, if legally required to do so. You know, and so um, I was just wondering if if HIPAA does legally protect your information in those specific cases now, or if uh, if not, or even if it does, would this new law kind of bolster that a bit? Yeah, I'll start again. Um, so. Under HIPAA, and I don't, I only know this as it relates to HIPAA. Um, when you are working with entities that are not covered by HIPAA specifically, so a hospital, let's say, working with this application, uh, they usually have to enter into something called a business associate agreement, where um, the hospital says a lot of their requirements that are required of them, they need to contractually follow as well as it relates to the application. I don't know how effective they are. <laughs> I think it's because it's more of a contractual relationship. Um, it's up to the hospital as to how much they're enforcing it. I don't think in terms of individuals um, and the applications that there is much um, accountability on that front. But interested, any, you all have any other thoughts? I actually don't know about interactions between ADPPA and is it, is it are, they, are all HIPAA covered entities exempted? Uh, no, if, well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> if you're required to comply with HIPAA and you comply with HIPAA, mm -hmm. then you then are you deemed to have complied with the relevant portions of the ADPPA yeah. that are the same, uh -huh. which is going to be a difficult comparison because they're not quite... Like with other laws, it's more it's clearer. Like, oh, there's a notice provision in the GLB right. and the Graham Leach Bliley, the financial um, financial bill. Like, okay, so if you meet the notice requirement in that law, then you're deemed to be to meet the notice requirement in the ADPPA. But what is what does it mean? Like, so under HIPAA, you can anonymize data, which means removing I think like 15 signifiers, and then you're basically freely allowed to do whatever you want with that data because it's deemed anonymized. Uh, I don't know how that's going to play with the de-identification in the ADPPA, which is fairly strong, but uh, is more like generally applicable because it has to apply to the to, to all of e-commerce basically, and not just hospitals and yeah. insurance companies. It is a really like comp it's like a very complicated. It, we I mean we just actually supported a bill in California that actually made it through the legislature, yay, um, <laughs> to extend protections for California's like. Uh, next step on, on top of HIPAA um, to make that apply to mental health apps because that was a really interesting area where it's like I think a lot of people kind of assumed oh I'm working with a professional therefore all my information must be covered under medical privacy laws and they and they really aren't I mean you know there are some laws about therapist notes that cover but then you know everything else that they collect about you so it even within one app it can be actually a little difficult to figure out what is supposed to be covered and what isn't and then also that phrase HIPAA compliant um, you know a lot of people claim they're HIPAA compliant but if they aren't covered by HIPAA then it doesn't actually matter if they're I mean it matters but it you know in terms of when the rubber hits the road um, and you challenge that assertion it's, it's kind of hard it's a, it's a tough question Hi, um, my question is about the um, uh, sort of its odds of passage, um, and you know where where do we see um, in terms of like whip count and and passing this, like co-sponsors who who cares about this a lot? What's like the core support among legislature legislators, mm -hmm. and then who is the um, sort of pool of legislators who those folks and advocates think they can get on board even if they're not themselves like advocating for it right now? Very insider baseball it's question. A very hairy yeah. question. We could have a whole new panel on just the politics of this bill. Uh, yeah, I guess to answer it briefly, there's there is a strong will in the House to pass this. So to sort of go over, they, there's there was a, the subcommittee on consumer protection and something had a hearing. It passed out of. Uh, 
uh, that subcommittee, I believe, unanimously. Um, and then it went to the full committee, the full Energy and Commerce Committee, and it passed out of the Energy and Commerce Committee 53 to 2, which is a ridiculous vote count given how contentious this type of this type of bill has been for the last 20 years. Um, and the two no's were actually California Democrats. Who wanted it to be stronger. Who wanted it to be stronger. <laughs> which I support, but also I need to... <laughs> need to get this I, is a very polite decision. Yes. <laughs> EFF and CDT don't disagree on a lot, but this happens to be one of them. Yeah. So, um, right, right now where it sits is that Speaker Pelosi basically needs to decide whether or not she's going to bring it to the floor and get a full vote. She just issued a, a fairly bland, but in my opinion, good for us press release yesterday that was just like, we commend the Energy and Commerce's work on privacy. Uh, there are concerns about preemption in California, and so let's keep talking. Basically, was the entire statement. So yeah, I think you could read that statement any way you wanted. Honestly, and yeah, I'm not nearly as optimistic. <laughs> any way they want it, but I'm going to read it as good for me. And <laughs> so, I mean, you do what you got to do, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, at this point, it's it's waiting for for Speaker Pelosi to move it. We've done a lot to try to push her to move it, and then the next question is the Senate. Senator Cantwell, who's the chair of the Commerce Committee in the Senate, has been very vocal about not supporting it, and so like the the paths forward in the Senate are fairly limited. So I guess what I'd say is unlikely, but not impossible. Which is pretty good for privacy legislation. Yes. yes. <laughs> It was impossible until about five months ago. So, What is interesting, though, even if it doesn't pass, I think, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong here, states might start adopting this model specifically when they're introducing I their own legislation possible. in yeah. upcoming sessions. And states won't preempt other states, so <laughs> I will have yeah. slightly different thoughts about that. They also can't protect people in other states. It's true. So, so the two, sorry, the two Georgia senators, the three Georgia, are they You should always call your senators yes. and your representatives and stuff you care about. Full throated agreement. Yeah. <laughs> always call your senators. Um, I don't think they've said anything publicly on it, in part because they haven't been there hasn't been like a, a opportunity or like a forcing mechanism for them to. But yeah, obviously any any support if you want it to pass, any support from from grassroots folks is always very helpful. Sorry, go for it. Uh, are there any components of the bill that would handle what would be typically under uh, like PCI compliance, so credit card data? Uh, I know that's more of an industry regulation, not legal. Um, and then on that, the big issue that I've always noticed in the PCI compliance side of things is educating small businesses on how much information they're accidentally giving out. Um, are there any anything in the bill that covers that to educate or make sure that it's not just small businesses getting slapped with fines without even knowing what's going on. Uh, to answer your, your second question first, mm -hmm. there's a provision for a, uh, shoot, I'm going to forget what it's called, a, a, an Office of Business Mentorship, I think is what it mm -hmm. is. And so that allows, if a company has a question about a practice or whatever, they can go talk to someone at the FTC and say, here's what we're doing is this kosher or not mm -hmm. kind of thing. So th there is at least some elements of sort of, yeah, mentorship for that. There's mm -hmm. also fewer requirements on small businesses. So yeah. if you make, uh, or if you if you earn less than I think 41 million in revenue a year, I think is the cutoff, then you, the number, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, num the number of requirements you have to meet are already much lower. Mm -hmm. With the uh, assumption just being that you have less personal data on hand or and you have less ability to like you know google facebook amazon yeah. all have huge compliance departments they are going to do what they can to comply with the laws smaller companies obviously don't mm -hmm. and we don't want to hang them out to dry obviously yeah. no one wants to no one wants a mom and pop shop to close because they didn't comply with privacy right. protections <laughs> so uh I, there are some some provisions in there for that uh your first question was on credit card data so 
Credit card and financial information is defined as sensitive, so there's stronger protections around them. You can't transfer it without, uh, you can't transfer that data without consent, and you can't collect it or, or process it, which includes merely storing it uh, unless it's strictly necessary to provide the service you're providing. So there's a lot more protections around that type of data uh, than there, I think, is, is currently. Thank you. So sorry to bring us back to the political sausage making, but uh, <laughs> as we go through the process, are there things, uh, even though it's a bipartisan bill, you've mentioned there's a couple kind of uh, more divisive issues. Are there things we should be looking to see get added or stripped out as we kind of go through the process that are going to be, you know, r relevant to the bill at large? I know I'm asking I mean, you to kind of look <laughs> yeah. into the future, but like, what are the things on the edges that are likely to get chopped off? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, as a bill moves through a legislature, I, I always doubt it will get stronger. <laughs> so that is right. um, that is something that that I am also worried about. I think that's part of why, you know, even though we're neutral, we're like we're trying to be as politely neutral as possible, right? Because it's like we'd like to see something stronger before this gets this gets weaker um so but i don't know inter i'm not in the rooms i'm not in the rooms where it happens so i mean it's at this point it's like such a political give and take so if someone asks for something then they're probably gonna have to give up something else and is that thing you're asking for more important than the thing you're about to give up that's a political calculation that you know i don't make either i my <laughs> My opinions on most of those things are just like, yeah, just get us the things we want, and then <laughs> that's that's it. Like that's all we. That's the way to solve the problem. So, so maybe to ask it another way, if the PRA goes away, both of you, I guess, would come out pretty strongly against that change. Would that, would you come out against the bill then? Yeah, there's uh, a, several red lines. The PRA being one of them, like diminishing the data minimization protections would be another one. Any, any changes to the civil rights protections, I think, would be, uh, in, in one direction, we would, we would not like that and would, and would pull support. Uh, so yeah, I think there, there's a lot of stuff that's pretty well baked in there, and at this point we're looking at the, sort of like the marginal, the more marginal issues, um, and trying to like work through those as well. But good question. Yeah. We're at time, but I'm happy to keep staying here and talk if anybody yeah, wants to Yeah, we can definitely continue. do one more question. One you're already standard, so <laughs> you're already standing, so you're grandfathered in. Mine, mine's a little less, uh, I don't know, um, severe than some of the other ones. <laughs> um, I'm curious on um, sort of the overall privacy activism of this with dealing with uh, data brokers and stuff. Your opinions on, um, what's the best way to put it? Um, <laughs> people who are use the law as it exists uh, in an activist way to show the bad sides of the law. Specifically, the example I'm thinking of, recently on John Oliver's show, <laughs> he uh, did a thing where they specifically targeted in DC three senators <laughs> and baited them with a certain click kind of thing. Uh, so, chaotic lawful, how do you feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Do you think it's more helpful or hurtful towards the overall cause? It's kind of like she is the expert on this. So I know. I'm like, I'm trying to think. I mean, I. It's a really interesting question. I because obviously he serves a media serves a like very different role in the activism community than I te technically or that I generally tend to think of of the activism community. I mean, I think there are things that can feel stunty but draw a lot of attention and so in some ways uh you know they say no publicity is bad publicity or you know um you can draw attention to some of those things would i personally want to do stunts like that probably not uh you know eff is a law firm and we are very well advised and so we are very careful about the things that we do um so I mean, I, you know, overall, whether it's more helpful or hurtful, I think it raises awareness about the issue. And so um, as long as it doesn't, um, you know, uh, doesn't become the only mechanism for activism, or as long as people don't think, oh, well, all of them are, are like this, then uh, I think it's, it's probably better to raise awareness. But it's, it's a tough one. I mean, yeah, it's a great question. 
if I was trying to apply, like if ADPO was to pass and I was trying to continue to do my activism, there's an exception for socially beneficial research or public research. I would probably try to say somehow that it had to do with research. I don't know what the actual requirements are for that, mm -hmm. but that's how I would approach that's it. A good, that's a good point.